Absolutely, yes. Doesn't take a trainer to be able to say that. You've learned it. Yes. And that's been something that's been trained repeatedly? Absolutely. That hasn't changed. It's crime time here on Closing Arguments, and throughout our coverage of the case against former police officer Derek Chauvin, the man accused of murdering George Floyd, uh, we've been getting a, a, a perspective from police officers and law enforcement professionals about many of the issues uh, that arise each and every day inside the courtroom. Let's introduce tonight's special guest. Joining us, retired Los Angeles Police Department Sergeant Cheryl Dorsey. Sergeant Dorsey started with the LAPD in 1980. She worked in patrol and specialized units, including gangs. She's also the author of Black and Blue, The Creation of a Social Advocate. Also back with us, retired police detective Vince Velasquez. Uh, Vince has 30 years of service with the Atlanta Police Department. He co-stars, and you, of course, recognize him from his uh, show, uh, ATL Homicide. And he was recently honored for raising awareness uh, to issues uh, of officers and victims' experience when solving violent crimes. Uh, Vince, uh, Sergeant Dorsey, great to have you both back on the program. I want to begin with some powerful testimony from the other day from Lieutenant Zimmerman. Uh, again, he is with Minneapolis uh, Police Department uh, talking about uh, Derek Chauvin's use of force. Let's take a listen. You saw Officer, then Officer Chauvin, with his knee on Mr. Floyd's neck, correct? Yes. Would you call what you saw there a use of force? Yes. And did that use of force continue until the ambulance arrived? Yes, it did. Was there any change in the level of force being used until the ambulance arrived? No. And what do you think about that use of force during that time period? I'm sorry? What do you think about that use of force during that time period? Uh, you're a little vague. Could you uh, li limit it to uh, the time frame? Right. Okay. So, um, based on your review of the body-worn camera videos of the incident, yes, and directing your attention you know, to that moment when Mr. Floyd is placed on the ground, yes. Um, what is your, uh, you know, your view of that use of force during that time period? Totally unnecessary. What do you mean? Um, well, first of all, uh, pulling him down to the ground, face down, and putting your knee on a neck for that amount of uh, that amount of time is just um, uncalled for. Um, it, I saw no reason why the officers felt they were in danger if that's what they felt. Um, and that's what they would have to feel to be able to use that kind of force. So, in your opinion, should that restraint have stopped once he was handcuffed and prone on the ground? Absolutely. All right. Um, a couple of things I want to try to break this down just a little bit. Uh, Sergeant Dorsey, I, a lot of these terms get thrown around, use of force and restraint. Is, is there a difference between restraining someone and a use of force? And, and what, is, what is that relationship? Well, I guess it depends on what the technique is, right? When we talk about use of force, uh, we're generally talking about uh, a technique. Uh, it could be a wrist lock or a twist lock or a chokehold or uh, firing your weapon. All of those are uses of force to varying degrees. When you talk about resistance, that's uh, what we're facing, what causes us to use force in the first place. And so officers all across these 18,000 police departments are all taught very similar. You only use that force necessary to overcome the resistance. And once you have a person in custody, in control, once they're in handcuffs, then the use of force must stop. And, and, I mean, the lieutenant who testified was very clear, not even a close call for him, Vince. Um, once someone is handcuffed, what are the tactics that police officers can use, should use, should not use? Under what circumstances do you need to do something beyond handcuffing someone? 
Um, well, you know, you mentioned his testimony. Let me start with that first. He was very careful, uh, to be quite honest with you. Some people are applauding him. Uh, to some degree, I do, but he was very careful with his words. Uh, not necessary. He never said it was excessive, and he never even said it was illegal. Um, and I think had it not been a police officer, his testimony may have been different. Uh, but moving on to your main question, once you have someone in custody and you have control of them, uh, and in this particular case, George Floyd, who clearly was not a threat anymore, you're trained to put that person on their side so they can breathe. There's absolutely no need to continue that amount of force uh, for that long to, what we, to, the, to the degree that what we saw uh, ultimately leading to George Floyd's death. Um, but again, I mean, this, this is unlike anything I think anyone in law enforcement has seen. Uh, police officers are not trained uh, to, to stop use of force when it's excessive. Like, I've never in my career got training to say, hey, if you see a police officer you know, out of line, using excessive force, this is what you should do. Uh, and there's many things that they should have done. Uh, and hopefully, you know, at the end of this, this, this episode, this trial, um, that we see changes in that. That's, that's my hope, is where police officers are trained to, to react to force that's excessive by other officers, and even if that means using force themselves. Sergeant Dorsey, one, one follow-up on, on all of this. Um, what, you, you, George Floyd, you know, the last several minutes, it's obvious he's not moving at all. In the beginning, there is some movement while they're cuffing him. If you're cuffing him and his legs are going, uh, is, is what do you do at that point? And, and to, to what extent do you stop doing it? That, I, I think that's where the little bit of the gray area is for a lot of folks who are watching this trial and trying to figure out what, are, what, what do police normally do, what should they do. When you've got someone doesn't want to go in the squad car, ends up on the ground, they finally, they, they're, they're able to cuff him, or he was already cuffed, but he's on the ground, and, and now the legs are going, and he's a big guy. What, what do you do to control him um, with, without harming him? Well, here's the thing. Okay, so he was in the back of a police car already in handcuffs when Chauvin showed up. Chauvin took him out of the police car and then put him on the ground for one reason in my mind and one reason only, and that was to punish him and ultimately torture him. So when you have someone on the ground now and they're flailing around and you're worried about being kicked, there is a maneuver, there's a technique, and we call it uh, hobbling someone where you wrap a cord around their feet to prevent them from moving their feet if they're trying to kick you. But you don't just hobble people just because you can. There has to be a reason and you have to be able to articulate it. And in the Minneapolis uh, Police Department, you also are required to have a supervisor on scene before you hobble someone. And so they didn't have any of that. There was no reason to hobble him. And the fact that he was talking and saying whatever he was saying, all of that is inherent to dealing with someone who may not want to go in the back of the police car. And that's why everything that we do is all about gaining control and not punishment. What we saw was Derek Chauvin punishing Mr. Floyd for nine minutes because, well, he could. I want to show you uh, some more testimony. This is from Sergeant John Edwards uh, testifying about uh, body cameras and when they're turned on and when they need to be turned off. Let's take a listen. And you indicated that officers uh, King and Lane were at the scene when you arrived? I did. Uh, publish Exhibit 81. Do you recognize the individuals in this photograph, Exhibit 81? I do. And who is this individual? It's Officer Lane. And this? It's Officer King. Can you tell the jury what uh, any interaction you had with officers Lane and King when you arrived? When I arrived there, I was met by Officer King first. First thing I did was I told him, hey, if you're Body-worn camera is not on. Turn it on now. He did. Uh, Officer Lane came out of the car several seconds afterwards, told the same thing to him, and he activated his body-worn camera. And this has raised a lot of issues, Vince, about when do the body cameras go on, when do they go off? I mean, at this point, 
George Floyd uh, is, is, is off the scene. He's no longer there. Um, so when are the cameras supposed to be on? When are they supposed to be off? And what is, what is proper here? Um, and, and I saw these videos, and, and I don't know the, in, in what context the sergeant was testifying to the whole story. Uh, obviously, this is after the fact. This is after George Floyd has been transported. Um, I'm curious to know, were the body cameras on? Did it capture um, all the encounter? And then they turned them off. I can understand why the sergeant wants those body cameras on. You have a person that's injured, that's not responsive, not breathing, en route to the hospital. That sergeant as a supervisor wants to capture any conversation that these officers are having, not just with each other, but with him as a supervisor. Um, it's troubling that the cameras went off. If they were on at some point and then they went off, it's a little troubling. If they were not on at all, then it's absolutely troubling because that means that they turned these cameras off uh, before the encounter ever happened. Uh, as if in anticipation of something yeah, that, happening. Yeah, that didn't happen. Their cameras were on. We, we've seen their cameras. Um, Chauvin's camera came off of his uh, uniform, so there's been there's very little video uh, from his perspective. But the the other officers there, their cameras were on. Sergeant Dorsey, what's the, what's the best practice here in the aftermath of of what happened with George Floyd in terms of, of body cameras? I would say err on the side of caution. If you're not really sure, just let it run. I mean, what's the harm in, in having too much, right? Uh, too much evidence, too much uh, conversation. Uh, you're going to be talking to witnesses and such. And so uh, just let the cameras run and you can turn it off once you get in your car and you're about to leave the scene. But, you know, there's so much... Um, skullduggery going on over there. We heard Chauvin tell the sergeant who responded initially that, hey, listen, I, you know, it was just a little guy was going crazy. He was out of control. And I, I kind of touched him a little bit, but not so much. And so he was really trying to create an audio record because police officers are savvy. And he knows that everything he's saying to the sergeant is being recorded. And he was trying to minimize the extent of force that was actually used I guess only to stall and buy himself a little bit of time because eventually the sergeant was going to find out and did that now we know the paramedics transported a deceased individual to the hospital in the name of George Floyd. All right, our experts are staying with us. We've got more Crime Time straight ahead, plus this. I'm Julia Janae in downtown Minneapolis for day six of the trial against former police officer Derek Chauvin. Important testimony today from the chief of police and the doctor who pronounced George Floyd dead. We'll have the latest from inside the courtroom. And tonight's 13th juror question, why do you think no one has shown up in court to support the defendant Derek Chauvin? Go to our Facebook pages and tell us what you think. Yeah, I was just uh, going to call you and have you come out to our uh, scene here. Um, not really, but we just had to, had to hold the guy down. He was uh, was uh, <clears throat> going crazy, wouldn't go in, uh, shutting off for the moment, wouldn't go in the back of the uh, <clears throat> squad. That is Derek Chauvin speaking with his sergeant. His sergeant actually called him at the scene. Uh, another one of the... Uh, aspects of this case we're looking at is the fact that you've got colleagues testifying against colleagues here or former colleagues uh, still with us Sergeant Cheryl Dorsey and Vince Velasquez let's take a listen to more of this testimony of, of Sergeant uh, Pluger here talking about his relationship uh, and knowing Derek Chauvin for many years I'm going to ask you if you're familiar with an individual named uh, Derek Chauvin I am Chauvin I apologize Derek Chauvin how are you familiar with this person uh, he was an officer on my shift. How long have you known him? Uh, probably since around 2008. Okay. So he was already working as an officer when you were hired? I don't think he was when I was hired, but okay. eventually he was on my shift, yes. He was on your shift? Correct. Okay. And do you recognize uh, Mr. Chauvin in the courtroom today? I do. Would you please point to him? Uh, right there. May the record reflect that the witness has identified the defendant. Any objection? Right here. And Could you please just describe your relationship with Mr. Chauvin? 
Uh, he was an officer on middle watch with me, uh, I'm going to say approximately 2008. So he'd been there a number of years, so I was supervised there. It was strictly a working relationship? Correct. You ever socialized with him uh, outside of a work setting? No. All right, Vince Velasquez, talk to us about this, this concept of, you know, here you've got Sergeant testifying against one of his officers, uh, worked with him for many, many years. Uh, it's a murder trial. What is that like? What do you think that's like? Um, you know, I've never been in that position, um, but I can imagine it's stressful. Um, it's someone who, you know, whether he had a personal relationship, he had a work relationship with, uh, and there is a camaraderie within police departments. Um, but this, this <laughs> officer is testifying truthfully. Uh, I think he understands the magnitude of this case um, and, and the gravity of, of the responsibility he has um, as a citizen and as a police officer to testify truthfully and give, give an account of whatever they ask him about their children. Uh, and from what I've seen, I think he's doing a pretty good job of doing that. Sergeant Dorsey, that can't be easy for, for in, in any profession. If you're testifying as someone you work with, it's not easy stuff. Well, listen, I can speak from personal experience because I testified against a co-worker uh, when I was on the Los Angeles Police Department, someone that I worked with uh, in the same division who, who I knew had animus towards black folks, me in particular, and black tow truck drivers specifically. And I was contacted by the city attorney, I'm sorry, by the district attorney to testify at the murder trial uh, against this officer. And I didn't have any problem doing it, Benny. You do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. In the instance when I testified, a black man had lost his life for only, the only reason is because he was a black man who this white officer didn't like. And so I would assume that these officers uh, are raising their hand and swearing under the penalty of perjury to tell the truth, and that's what they're doing. It's an easy fix, it's an easy say. They know what they saw, and it was unreasonable. Sergeant Dorsey, Vince Velasquez, thank you so much for your time and your insight tonight. Really appreciate it. Come back soon. Thank you. Thank you, Benny.